Hey, this is Joe with Great Bench Electronics. Welcome back to the Pedal Teardown series where I take apart new and interesting pedals and show you what's going on inside. Today we have the Acid Fuzz Mark II Mini. All right, this is the Mark II Mini from Acid Fuzz. Acid Fuzz is one of those small batch vintage uh, fuzz pedal builders. They are from Los Angeles. I think they started out in Los Angeles and now they're in Michigan. Seems like most of their pedals are on like an email waiting list. It looks like maybe they have one or two that are available just off their website for custom order, uh, but most of them have some sort of waiting list. I don't know how long they are. It looks like they have a whole line of pedals based off of vintage fuzz that are in a more standard like 125B size enclosure like this. And then they also do vintage builds in like the original enclosure. So the, the round saucer fuzz face, the kind of triangular trapezoidal tone bender enclosures. Anyway, so you can probably tell from the aesthetics of this pedal, it's based off a Tone Bender Mark II. It's in a 125B size enclosure, so standard enclosure. The original Tone Bender ones are longer and have um, sort of a, a triangular shape at the bottom that's uh, slanted for pressing on with your foot. This is their Mini, at least I believe it's called the Mini version. It's hard to tell because I don't actually see this pedal on their website anymore, uh, but it's built in a more standard enclosure. But as far as controls, we have level and attack, which is straight off the tone bender. There's also a bias knob here on the side, which is going to affect the, the bias conditions of at least one of the transistors inside. We know from being a tone bender Mark II, there should be three transistors. The bias here is going to affect one of them. On the top here, we also have an on or off switch. This just disconnects the battery. Uh, it's an easy way to stop the battery from draining when the pedal's not in use. The normal way you do this is not with a switch, but just by removing the input jack. You allow the ground connection for the battery to connect to the ring terminal on a stereo jack. And then of course, ground is usually connected on the jack itself to the uh, sleeve connection. However, for a mono jack, the ring and sleeve are gonna connect to the same place. Where is well, the tester cable? So for a stereo jack, there would normally be a separation uh, band here that would separate the ring from the tip and the sleeve. But for a mono jack, which is what a guitar pedal standard use, the sleeve and ring are just one piece. And so only when you plug it all the way would the battery terminal connect between these two because the sleeve makes that connection or the jack makes it between the two. And so if you want to stop the battery from draining, you just pull out the input jack and now that ring connection is no longer touching the sleeve, which completes the circuit. But for some builds, especially like on a pedal board, it may be difficult or even impossible to manually remove the input jack without like lifting up the whole pedal, which makes it kind of cumbersome to stop the battery draining. And so Acid Fuzz just added in a switch here to turn off the, to disconnect the battery. So when it's off, the battery is probably the ground connection just lifted. When it's on, then the battery's connected or in circuit. Standard latching foot switch here, probably a triple pole double throw. Although we don't have an indicator LED on this, so it could just be a double pole double throw. That would be more historically accurate. Top mounted input and output jacks. These look like the standard Neutrik style with the metal nut and the plastic shoulder washer. The enclosure has a hammer tone gray paint, which is correct for the original Tone Bender Mark IIs. On the back here, we have the Acid Fuzz logo um, with their sort of tag, boutique, stomp box, handmade, and then their website. Uh, this one is serialized number 117. We do have two pieces of hardware here. These aren't, as far as I can tell, they're not hex screws. Um, actually, they might be hexes. Actually, yeah, I think they are hex screws. They're really tiny though. Let me see. So, might be a 50 thou hex. Yeah, so that's a, a 50 thou hex screw there. And that's probably holding up the PCB inside. But well, we shall see in a second. That's it for the externals. Let's go ahead and crack open the pedal. All right, so here's the inside of the Acid Fuzz Mark II Mini. Um, so first thing we can obviously see, we have a, not really a PCB per se, but what I would call like a proto board or strip board style build. Uh, so there's strips of copper running across that connect the rows, and then you connect components across uh, different spots in the rows and often will break the copper rows on the proto board in order to make circuit connections. First thing I see is a lot of mojo parts in here. We have some of these tropical fish style capacitors like these doohickeys here. They're just a different style of capacitor. Uh, I, I've talked about mojo parts in the past, and I, I don't know if it'd be fair to say that I poo-pooed them, but I suggested that maybe it's not worth the trouble. And I'll stand by that. Generally speaking, I don't think the sonic differences, I think it'd be pretty farcical to try to track down or specify 
a specific positive tonal improvement to a specific part. Metal film resistors and capacitors work fine. Modern electrolytics are hardy and readily available. Mojo parts like this, they can also work fine. Uh, they are much more expensive. They're harder to track down. You'll often get bad parts, used parts, stuff like that. So maybe for a builder on this scale, it works. But generally for the DIY crowd, I don't know if it's really worth it. Uh, I don't think the tonal improvement it makes much of a difference. Uh, but of course, people will disagree. I'd presume Acid Fuzz would disagree. And um, yeah, so that's just my two cents. But yeah, definitely Mojo build here. As far as transistors, obviously... We have some vintage germanium here. These are OC84s from, doesn't say Muller as far as I can tell, but they're marked to Great Britain, which is essentially Muller. There, are, there were other um, transistor builders in the UK in the 60s, but this font and uh, marked made in Great Britain, it's Muller. We have shielded wire connecting the quarter inch jacks up here to the foot switch, which is good. Using shielded wire, especially in a high gain circuit like a fuzz pedal, is a good idea. It will help prevent uh, unwanted noise from getting into the circuit as well as um, keeping oscillations down. Component wise, we have electrolytics here. The gold one here is marked RO or ROE. This one I can't really read the code, but I've seen that blue film on, I believe, Phillips made. There's another blue one hidden in here. More the another one of these tropical fish capacitors. There's three of those tropical fish caps and carbon comp resistors hidden down closer to the board. I'm not expecting anything radically different with the circuit design on this pedal. It wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to go for like a mojo part build, but then make significant modifications to the circuit. People who are gonna buy this are gonna want it for the classic tone bender sound, which you get by using the correct values for the circuit. That being said, we do have a little trim pot here. Judging by the location, it's coming off of the input jack. So it's coming right over here with this shielded cable. It's an, most like an input trim, the same way sort of analog man does a an input potentiometer right at the input to get that guitar rolled back volume sound without actually having to do it to your guitar. So you can run your guitar at full volume, just trim this back a little bit, and you'll get more or less the same effect. It's not quite the same, but it, the, the general gist is there. The two potentiometers hidden underneath, the level and attack, that's your fuzz and your volume controls here, level and attack. Over here is the bias control. Uh, all the pots are alpha. The value for the bias is probably a 10K. Can't read it, but it's either five, like a five or 10K, something like that. Usually that's gonna sit on the collector of one of the transistors, uh, which is gonna adjust your collector voltage, which adjusts your bias point for that transistor. It's coming right over here to this side of this transistor here. So I'm presuming if this is Q1, Q2, Q3, it's probably adjusting the bias on Q3, I guess. Standard blue, triple pole, double throw foot switch here. I do see all three poles of the switch doing something, at least it looks like it is. And so it's not quite clear. Usually one of these will be used for switching on and off the LED. Um, so I'll have a closer look at that and see what's going on there. As far as the rest of the build, we do have uh, the plastic quarter inch jacks. I don't see marking, I don't see brand marking on them, but it's probably Noid Trigger Switchcraft, one of those. Battery snap here, there is no DC input jack for this pedal, it's only nine volt battery, which you can understand for a, a, a PMP vintage fuzz like this, where there's, you're not gonna be doing like a charge pump or a voltage inverter to inside the pedal give you that negative nine volts for the PMP. Just doing a battery snap is probably the safe way to make sure people don't blow up their nice fancy transistors. Uh, the nine volt battery snap here is polarized, so there's only one way to put in the battery so that it's correct and you can only give the correct polarity to the transistors. There's a little tie down for the battery cable here. It's like a little piece of aluminum with some foam adhesive backing and that's just giving strain relief to the battery snap just in case this, uh, if you pull on this, it's not gonna pull the wires out of the board. And then yeah, down here, here's your power switch and that's wired up here to the ring of the input jack. So it's disconnecting the, uh, what should be It'll actually be the positive side of the battery because we want the positive tied to ground and the negative being the negative novel supply for the PMP. So it is ground, it's, it's positive ground. You may have noticed the screw situation down here. So when I bought this pedal, I had asked the seller to pop the back off just so I could see what's going on inside, just make sure it, it looks right and hasn't been messed with too much. And unfortunately, the seller had broken off the screw for the bottom one here. It was actually seized up, it wasn't their fault. Um, it was seized or corroded. Uh, and the screw was stuck. And when they went to unscrew it, the, the screw just sheared off. I still bought it because I knew, you know, I, I've taken broken screws out of pedals before. It's a little bit laborious, a little bit difficult, but not too bad. My usual technique is just to use a screw extractor, which is just a, it's a hardened steel tool that has sort of reverse cut threads. 
and as you unscrew, it bites down into the, the screw metal, and it looks something like that. It bites down into the screw, and then as you back it off, it bites more and more and more, eventually hopefully, hopefully breaking free the screw. Uh, in this case, though, unfortunately, the, the stuck screw had a better bond to the aluminum uh, screw holder here, or, or, you know, screw buttress coming out of the enclosure here, than the aluminum did to itself and it just broke away part of the, the screw wall here. It's unfortunate, you know, it's, it's something that can happen when you're extracting screws. It's never a good day when you're trying to pull a, a stuck screw out. Sometimes stuff like this happens. This definitely needs to be dealt with in some way, and I've been thinking about how I wanted to deal with it. I foresee about four different options. Option one is the most obvious, which is to do nothing, to recognize that three screws absolutely can hold on a back door for a pedal, probably even just two screws or even one screw. So three screws would be sufficient, however, this is always going to bug me that there's a screw missing here. I'm not crazy about this idea, and it, you know, it, I can tell it will annoy me to know I just I just ignored the problem essentially. Um, but it is, that is one option. Option two is to try to attach back on this broken off piece of metal. Try to like JB weld that back on. For multiple reasons, I don't like this idea. Number one, there's not a ton of surface area to put the adhesive to get this back on there. Number two, it's not like the repair will be invisible. Uh, number three, you will pretty much never be able to tighten down that screw uh, because that screw will just immediately break this off if you put any torque on it. Uh, so for multiple reasons, gluing this back on is just not a good idea in my opinion. Option number three would be to try and rehouse the pedal. So that would be getting another 125B size enclosure, moving all the guts over to a new enclosure. Downside of that is one, having to pretty precisely drill at least these two holes, but also drilling all the rest of the holes for the whole enclosure. So it's gonna take some time and money to do that. It also is not going to have the silk screen, the graphics, because it's going to be just a raw enclosure, nor the hammer tone paint job. And you're still not really addressing the problem. Uh, you're just sort of replacing the enclosure. And then option four is to actually drill down deeper into the metal here. So run the drill further down. This is all solid aluminum, so there you could still do it. So just drill down deeper into this hole, then just use like a really long screw for this one hole. That's, that's another option. I don't know how I feel about that one either because one, it's some pretty precise drilling. You know, this isn't, this isn't uh, perfectly straight here, so the drill has to go in at a slight angle. And two, finding that screw might be kind of difficult. That's a long screw with a flange head that's fairly slim in diameter. Uh, it's sort of a specialized screw. So I'm not sure what the right solution is to this problem. If you have any ideas that maybe I'm missing, I'd love to hear about in the comments. I'm probably leaning towards the rehousing idea and just keeping the original enclosure just, you know, just to have it, but I'm not sure. So if you have any ideas or, you know, a preference that you think would be the best, let me know in the comments. But anyway, with all vintage fuzzes, one thing I like to do is I like to come in and see what the voltages are on the different transistor legs. So why don't we pull out a multimeter and hook up a battery and we'll see where that's sitting at. All right, so we got our battery here. Let's get a reading on the battery. Battery is at 9.11 volts. Turn on the pedal. It is on, okay. Now, because this is a positive ground pedal, we're gonna hook the positive up to ground. That way, on our multimeter, it'll read positive voltages, even though we know it's actually negative voltages, it's just easier to read. There's not a good place to touch the leads here, except like underneath the transistor itself. So I'm just grabbing, I'm just grabbing a lead in my little lead box to hopefully be able to touch in here. Probably need a quarter inch jack put into the input as well to complete that circuit. So these are a little bit hard to get to. Uh, all right, so Q1, assuming this is Q1 here, the emitter is tied to ground, most likely, and that's reading zero volts, so that makes sense. I'm assuming that the white covering here is the emitter, the blue is the base, and the red is the collector. Collector is about 8.7 volts in the base. I don't know if I can get to the base here. That looks like the base there, 0 0.036 volts. All right, moving on to Q2. I believe that's the emitter again. Look, I think I'm right on it there. That should be zero volt base. Yeah, right there. I think that was correct. 0 0.079 volts. And then collector. Yeah, there's your collector for Q2, 0.298 volts. So this is the emitter for Q3 here. 0.217 base looks like 0.295. The collector is probably tied to the uh, potentiometer here. So that's probably the battery side of the potentiometer, the bias control. So this should be the collector side and that's at six volts. And then if 
we turn the bias control, you'll see that voltage goes up and down. And now we're getting up to essentially full battery voltage. About five and a half volts there. If that's tied directly to the collector, we should, yeah, this, uh, this red covering on the collector here for the Q3 is very well sized, but I would assume that this potentiometer is tied to the collector, which is right about, well, it's at five and a half volts, but it will change with the bias control. So there's the voltage measurings on the transistors for the uh, Mark II Mini here. All right, so that's it for the inside of the Acid Fuzz Mark II Mini. Let's go ahead and put the uh, back door back on. All right, that was Teardown on the Acid Fuzz Mark II Mini. If you have any questions or recommendations for a pedal you wanna see on an upcoming Teardown episode, let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate you hitting the like button and subscribing. I'm Joe from Gray Bench Electronics. Thank you for watching.